Before we launch into part three of this wonderful episode with Jeffrey West, I want to thank our sponsor, Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded finance products and services, empowering businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. Let's get into part three of Scale with Jeffrey West. Jeffrey West, welcome back. It's so great to have you back. Hey, Aidan, nice to be back. And thank you once again for inviting me. I'm very much looking forward to our, the continuation of our conversation. You're going to be sick of me, man. Oh, <laughs> not at all. I've, I've really enjoyed this very much. It's fantastic. And I have a real treat in store for our audience today. And we were talking off air there. A part of the book I absolutely loved and you loved writing and researching as well. So I'm going to tee you up for this part because this has so many implications, the mental model that it provides for innovation, for learning, for any type of system is just profound. And I learned so much from this. I had a, another one of those beautiful breakthrough moments when I read about this. So regarding model systems, you say, the big question is how do you realistically and reliable, reliably scale up the results and observations of the model system to the real thing. We've discussed that in previous episodes. This entire way of thinking has its origins in a sad failure. And we hinted to this before in ship design in the middle of the 19th century, and the marvelous insights of a modest gentleman engineer into how to avoid it in the future, which brings us to the Great Eastern the wide gauge railways and the remarkable Isambar Kingdom Brunel. To set you up here, I'll ask our audience a question. And I've kind of given you the answer. In 2002, the BBC conducted a nationwide poll to select the 100 greatest Britons of all time. Perhaps predictably, many people said Winston Churchill, he came in first, Princess Diana came in third, followed by Charles Darwin in fourth, William Shakespeare, Isaac Newton, a uh, pretty impressive triumvirate. But who came in second is the question. And I've given you the answer there. But at this stage, I'll hand it over to you, Jeffrey. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Aiden. Yeah, no, it's a wonderful story that yes, this 2002 uh, poll that the BBC did. Um, and by the way, Princess Diana uh, came in third because she had all the, you know, I think she had just died a little bit earlier. I suspect, I mean, with all due respect to her, if it were done now, she probably wouldn't be up there uh, quite so high, that's for sure. She, but um, number two was indeed this extraordinary man um, with a, um, ama a amazing name, um, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Um, and uh, if you look him up, anyone looks him up, I'm sure they would show a classic picture of him looking. He was, I think he was quite short, actually. I think he was not much more than about five feet. Um, and uh, but looking dapper in his top hat and so on with the chains, the one they usually show are these enormous chains, the links of which almost as big as him, honestly, that the chains to chain the the ship that he had built called the Great Eastern um, to the docks and uh, um, and the story of the Great Eastern is what you referred to earlier but but let me just say a few words about Brunel I'd always been uh, as many Britons uh, are or were imp um, impressed by him because he was considered the greatest engineer of the 19th century he was sort of the manifestation of the great engineering triumphs coming out of the Industrial Revolution. And um, he started out, I think, even at his father was a great engineer. And um, he worked with his father jointly um, at age 19, and designed the first tunnel under a navigable river, namely the River Thames down at Rotherhithe, where the river is quite wide. Um, and they designed this, you know, it was quite a feat in 18, I don't know, I may have some of my, you know, I haven't reread the, the, I haven't reacquainted myself. So I may get some of the details of these stories wrong, I have to say, but it was, I think, by the 1830s, he, um, they designed this, the, the, the tunnel under the bridge, 
under the, the river. And um, it was a, uh, I think it was a walking tunnel. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't traffic walking. And in fact, it was, people were so excited. Um, I think if my memory is correct, uh, they charged for you to walk under it, you know, sixpence or something. And then, um, and I think they had about 2 million visitors a year. It was a huge attraction. Um, and then it gradually, of course, you know, people lost interest. And then it became the usual problems of tunnels in various places under streets or rivers, all kinds of the, the, the dark side of society took over, so to speak. And what is interesting about that tunnel is that eventually they closed it. They closed it to pedestrian traffic and it was expanded into what became a tunnel for the London Underground <laughs> to go onto the Thames. So he was, anyway, that goes back to when he was 19. And then he's famous for maybe one of the most famous things he's fa that he's known for is he designed um, the, the great suspension bridge, the Clifton Bridge over the River Avon um, in, uh, I guess, Somerset. Uh, that he designed, I think it was only about 24, only a few years later, and it was the longest suspension bridge and so on and so forth. And it's wonderful to go look at it, actually. I was just thinking about that, Jeffrey. Imagine popping into your son, he's 19, and kind of going, hey, buddy, what are you up to? Ah, oh, just designing a, a tunnel underneath the Thames. Exactly. All right, I'll see you later. <laughs> I'll leave you to it, sir. <laughs> he was extraordinarily innovative. Um, and I'll come to the thing that's more relevant for scale and this discussion. But the other thing that he's famous for, that people know know him about, is many tunnels and bridges across Britain, probably even in Ireland. I don't know. I should have looked that up. I, I wouldn't be surprised. But he um, um, he also made the Great Western Railway. I think he was one of the owners in the end, um, the best railway in Britain. But it became the best because he, and this is relevant for scale, actually, this, this, this little story, namely, um, he used wide gauge. And uh, the, the gauge that was used to construct the, the railways in early 19th century across Britain, everyone used uh, the, what is now the standard gauge. I may get this slightly wrong, four foot eight and a quarter is uh, <laughs> and why is it that distance and brunel was one of the few that thought about it and here's the the amazing thing and this does have relevance for modern day namely the reason it was four foot eight and a quarter was because that was what had been used in the mines in order to haul coal through the tunnels but the four foot eight and a quarter was the minimum size that you could have a cart horse walk with a, you know trucks behind them carrying the coal on rails so that had defined it, this arbitrary distance because of the size of the uh, of a cart horse comfortably so he was one of the few that said now wait a minute uh, let's think about this a little bit and he realized that if you made it almost over two feet wider it would it had lots of engineering advantages and in particular it would stop the swaying of you know obviously if you make it wider you can make it more robust and so on so lots of advantages and the great western railway was in fact um considered the best railway in the, in the united kingdom or in england anyway um and it uh, went uh, the original one was london to but the london to bristol line is brunel's line and he built fantastic bridges and so on and to make that the sort of the, the centerpiece, he built Paddington Station. So if you want to see his work, just go to Paddington. And there you will see built or designed in detail, by the way, by Brunel. So um, that's great. Now, unfortunately, just to finish that little story, of course, you have eventually by the towards the end of the 19th century, you needed to integrate the railway system. And so there was a major commission. And even though I think it agreed that the wide, the wide gauge was better, since everybody else had this narrow gauge um, originating in the, the, the width of the backside of cart horses, <laughs> that was decided. So that 
permeated not just England, but the United Kingdom, but the world. <laughs> I think it's true here, right here in New Mexico. I think we have the same, the same gauge uh, for the major lines. Anyway, so, um, but he was very innovative in this respect and sort of, quote, thinking out of the box. And one of the things that he did in the middle of the 19th century was he was the one of the first to realize how crucially important it was to make bigger ships. And he used a scaling argument. He realized it. He realized the following, um, and it's really a um, uh, using the Galilean argument that I think I talked about in the first episode about the difference between scaling of areas and therefore the strength of a beam versus the, the, the weight that it has to hold up which scales like a volume. And so in that case, in the Galilean argument, as you scale up, the weight scales much faster than the strength holding up that weight. And the system, if you don't change anything, it collapses. So you have to innovate. And that's the, or the primitive origin of innovation. So he had an analogous argument for ships. And uh, what he realized was, obviously, the amount of cargo that you can carry um, goes like the volume of the ship. Um, but the drag through the sea is the cross-sectional area pushing against the ocean. So what he realized was if you build bigger ships, you can, so if you double the size of a ship, you could carry two times two times two, eight times as much cargo, but the drag only goes up by a factor of four, two times two. So per pound or ton of cargo, the bigger you are, the more efficient it is and the cheaper it is to run it. Therefore, build bigger ships. That's why we have these humongous tankers now because of that base. I mean, fundamentally because of that argument that Brunel realized and said, okay, we got to do it, but we can't do it with wood. We're going to have to build iron ships, which people had already started to do, but we're going to build them big. And he built, the first one was big, but it wasn't hugely bigger than what had been built before, um, was, um, he built it called the Great Britain, I think it was called, and it was extremely successful. And by the way, just another side to this about innovation, a lot of this was driven clearly by finance and economics and politics, because Britannia ruled the waves. I hate to say it to an Irishman. <laughs> but we were, <laughs> it's but all right, man. <laughs> this idea of England and London controlling the world, empire, and all the rest of 19th century. It's an important point, though, because I just wanted to say, like, R Roman roads was why they conquered the world as well, because they could travel and they could conquer and Absolutely. go wide, etc. It's, so it's quite analogous, quite analogous. So he was driven um, to some extent, well, to a large extent, in not just in solving a big engineering problem, but by, you know, the, the economics of it and the sort of, I don't know, in personally, but the sort of patriotic drive to control the world and have the British Empire, you know, the image of Queen Victoria running everything kind of. <laughs> so uh, all the stuff I learned when I was a little boy. And uh, so, um, so then um, he in, in turn, and that's a big lead up to the very story that you introduced um, about the ship called the Great Eastern, because one of the um, one of the big challenges was um, communication and getting cargo to and from and exploiting Australia. And um, that was a big challenge. And he said, okay, I'm going to build a ship that can go from here to Sydney and back, and no Suez Canal, by the way, and uh, do it there and back um, on one load of coal. It probably would have got stuck, by the way, Jeffrey, in the Suez Canal. <laughs> <laughs> before before you you go into that would you mind if i just i just wanted to read it because the firstly the 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 broad gauge 
track story is so important for our audience to understand because one of the things we talk about is first principles going back to first principles. And this is what Brunel did so well, he's like, going, why are we building on that uh, flawed assumption of the past? Things have changed, we need wider gauges. But then the status quo overpowered him, the standardization of things overpowered him. And despite it being a revolutionary in innovation, it got quashed. And I just wanted to say that because you can see how important that was that decision in the past. And also, in organisations, we make decisions based on things that we don't ever reflect and kind of go, let's go back to basics here and build it as if we're building it for today, not based on mindsets of the past. I just wanted to really emphasize that because yes, that thank you for doing that. And that's very important. And I maybe I should have said a couple more words, because one of the things that you realize, and I'm sure people recognize it, we can think of other examples, and especially now in terms of computers. I mean, I mean, it drives you nuts, all these different connectors and so on. I mean, there's a small, trivial example of it that we don't have universal connection, for example, and universal standards and so on, which have been talked about for quite a while. And maybe eventually we will. Um, so there's that side. But there's also the other thing that's interesting about the railway is that once you've made that decision, when you have something so powerful and big and extensive, is that it's fixed. You can't undo it once you've made that, that particular. Now, these connectors and things we can do, but there are probably other things to do with broadcast and the way we deal with the internet that sort of get you know, fixed and they're not optimal. And in fact, some are counterproductive. And, and uh, we need to think through those things. And you need, you know, you need people like Brunel um, that sort of think out of the box. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's what some of the, the, you know, some of the most successful people in Silicon Valley have been able to do, even though they've also been some of the worst, in my opinion, of uh, <laughs> doing the opposite to that, of forcing us to do things. I mean, I, I'll get into trouble with this, but um, you know, like Microsoft Word, I think is a terrible example of getting something that's going to has forced us to do things in a certain way that I that is highly non-creative and uh, very restrictive. Um, and uh, well, we're probably stuck with it for a very, very long time. Anyway, well, you, uh, you know, you know about the QWERTY keyboard. You know that story. Yeah, the QWERTY keyboard is a fantastic example of that. This ridiculous keyboard that we have, you know, and so on. There's lots of examples like that. And you know, once they're there, that's it. I mean, the QWERTY keyboard is again, you know, it's it's sort of like these connectors. It's not terrible. It makes things a little more inefficient and annoying at times. Um, especially when you're learning, but you know it's not so bad. But when it when it's the whole railway system, or presumably you know there's analogs in the airline system and other kinds of system, trans, various kinds of transport systems. That once they're done, I mean I don't know I've I've not done any research or an investigation on things like the London Underground. You know what whether you know how what was the thinking? Or was it just what I suspect it was, and the way things were always done, you just thought, oh, well, we want to go from here to there, and we just go it, and we don't, you know, rules of that, we build it this way, we do that, yes, not a big sarcastic. No, you're right, you're right, though, because I went to a, a magnificent uh, exhibition in the Museum of History in, in London, and th th one of the, there was comments by people working on the tracks today, and they were asked questions like, what would be the one question you'd ask? And they kind of go, well, I wish they'd built it in a way that it could be scaled or yes. developed so further. Didn't. No, they didn't, of course. And that's the problem. So that going back now to the Great Eastern and our marvelous Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Um, so he had this vision, which was fantastic. Um, and by the way, he got a lot of pushback on building bigger and bigger ships are made of iron because the, again, you know, the naive use that and iron just sinks. It'll just sink if you make it too big. Uh, you know, so you have to understand sort of elementary physics and hydrodynamics and so forth. Um, and he did do that. So, um, but the the uh, the great uh, the great Eastern was conceived to be this ship, as I said, that was going to go to Australia and back. Was the original idea 
on one load of coal. And um, he, uh, because there would obviously be problems with that. I mean, problems trying to get, uh, you know, efficiently cargo to and from Australia. So um, uh, he designed a ship that I forget how much bigger, I'm sure I wrote about it in the book, uh, of the order of twice as big as any other ship, twice as long. And, and in fact, no ship was built bigger than that for at least 50 more years, which is kind of extraordinary. So he made this huge leap and he built this ship and uh, this wonderful ship. And uh, I'm going to be slightly uh, cartoonish about it. You know, there it was on the docks and they had the big opening and they started the engines. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I got one other point that he did that was fantastic. Um, was that he also was someone that was a huge proponent of moving away from, of course, sales, which were often used as supplementary power, um, and um, uh, paddle wheels to um, propellers. Seems sort of obvious, but it was a huge leap and pro shaft propellers at the back driving the ship, which is, of course, standard. But um, so they started up the old propellers, and they, you know, get the old ship going, and it could barely move. <laughs> it's not quite true, of course, but it obviously moved, but it was, put, it was significantly underperforming. It basically could not move very fast, it was, and it was very inefficient. Not only that, it swayed tremendously back and forth, uh, relative to you know ships uh, ships nowadays and certainly ships of that time was it 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 was somewhat unstable in that sense it wasn't unstable it wasn't going to keel over but it was unstable so it had lots and lots of problems and um it it came to an ignominious end it, it did make it never made i don't think it ever went to australia but it did go transatlantic a couple of trips um and uh, it, uh, but it was a total failure in in the sense of what it was built for, and uh, it um, was eventually it was useful because it was so big they used it, and uh, so this is a, a marvelous ending in a funny way. It's sort of repurposing. It um, was used to lay the first major transatlantic phone line. So, um, you know, it did come to some use uh, in a very, very significant way, actually. And then eventually it was broken up um, uh, by somewhere towards the maybe the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. But one of the things I discovered when I wrote the book, so I knew some of this stuff, but one of the things I discovered when they broke it up, it was roughly at the time, so it must have been the end of the 19th century, it was roughly at the time when Liverpool Football Club was being constituted as a serious entity. And uh, they were looking for some symbol or flagpole or whatever, and they took either the flagpole or the mast from the Great Eastern, and they put it up there at uh, Liverpool at the cop end. And, it, and as of the time I wrote the book, it was still there. So it's kind of wonderful. Brilliant. So I'm very, I, I'm, I have great respect for Liverpool, although I can't stand them as a football team, but that's another story. <laughs> and by the way, tomorrow is a major day because Tottenham, the, my team, which is the great burden of my life, uh, are playing Liverpool at Liverpool. And if my memory serves me right, I don't think they've won at Anfield um, since uh, since the flag time. was put in, <laughs> Roughly speaking for over a hundred years, for uh, they've only won about half a dozen times. Even when they were a great team, they were they they have this thing, so it doesn't look good. But anyway, sorry, that's got nothing to do with anything. But it's a nice story that the, that this flagpole ended up, you know, still around today. But anyway, so this was a huge failure. And um, in, in every respect, uh, both, uh, of course, economically, but also um, just, just in terms of engineering. I mean, this man had been unbelievably successful and innovative, and he tried to do something that was, uh, you know, enormously courageous and exciting, and it had failed. And um, he was 
smart enough that uh, he realized that, you know, uh, we better understand what's going on here. And one of the things that became very apparent was that part of the reason was, the major reason was, they actually didn't know, didn't really know the science of ships, which is sort of amazing when you think about it. You know, the science of ships, shipbuilding, and of hydrodynamics um, wasn't really understood. And certainly none of it had gone into the planning other than this delightful argument that he used to motivate it of the economy of scale. And, um, and one of the things that came out of it was that there was this young man that, named William Froud, F-R-O-U-D-E, uh, Froud, um, who um, had worked for Brunel or Brunel's company on the Great Western Railway, funnily enough. And uh, it might have even worked a little bit on the Great Eastern, I don't know. Um, but uh, Froud was a mathematician educated at Oxford, and um, he became very intrigued about this. And uh, it, at the same time, around that time, the fundamental laws of hydrodynamics were formulated, uh, the so-called Navier-Stokes equations, which formulate the basis of all hydrodynamics, indeed, so much so the basis really of our understanding of weather, as well as, you know, the, so that's hydrodynamic phenomenon in terms of currents of the ocean and, of course, the currents of the air. So those were formulated around this time, sort of the... I, I don't remember the dates right, 1870, maybe. And uh, Froud, so it was sort of in the air. And Froud said, look, there must be a better way of doing all this. And um, he is, he realized that um, what we need to do is first of all, understand the science, but we need to understand scaling up. And in some ways, he's the modern beginning of the whole idea of scaling and of modeling, the whole idea of modeling something really goes back to William Froud. What I wanted to really share about this and why I really think this part of the book is so important, and it's firstly, it's great, it's well written, etc. But it's the lessons you impart through these stories that are so profound and so interesting. And here's one of them. Here, here's I just wanted to go back to Brunel. And then the building onto Froud, excuse the pun. But you said when systems fails or designs don't meet expectations, there are usually uh, there are usually a plethora of reasons that could be the problem. These could include poor planning and execution, faulty workmanship or materials, poor management and even a lack of conceptual understanding. However, there are key principles like that of the Great Eastern, where the major reason for failure was that there were, they were designed without a deep understanding of the underlying science and of the basic principles of scale. Indeed, until the last half of the 19th century, neither science nor scale played any significant role in the manufacture of most artifacts, let alone ships. The reason I wanted to share that was, it gave me a great thought because I was thinking about this and I was going, there's this great, you mentioned San Francisco, for example, Silicon Valley, the great words of, of fail fast and fail quickly. Yes, you can fail yourself forward. That is extremely important. And, and I'm talking about cultures of innovation here. But you do need to know that there are toolkits and frameworks and mental models, and the culture of failing quickly and understanding and moving forwards through failure and iteration, etc. You can't do one or the other, you can, but you'll ultimately come to a, a, a Brunel finish with the Great Eastern here, you'll end up maybe as a flagpole <laughs> in a football club. <laughs> but but it, that part is so important because I, I teach a lot and stuff in edu in or organizations on mindset and culture of innovation. And that's, that's the acceptance of failing forward. But I also then go, you need to understand the frameworks. And oftentimes you get resistance because the organization thinks they can do one or the other. But doing both is a recipe for success. Exactly. Yes, you said it wonderfully. That's exactly right. Exactly right. And I would add to that something that um, um, I was going to say after talking a little bit more about fraud was that, 
you know, if you, um, and, and I'm not sure Froud even realized this, but it becomes very apparent that, you know, if you make a small change, because most of the, here's what you have to recognize is that most of the changes in shipbuilding from the very beginnings of primitive boats all the way up, you know, to rowboats to, and so on and so forth, all the way up to, um, um, you know, that, that time, most of the increments were small and you learned by trial and error. So if you increase something by a few percent, you know, you increase the, the size of a ship by five or 10%. Well, it probably isn't optimal because you just do rules of thumb. It's all rules of thumb. This is what we did before. You just, you know, add another 5% here, another 5% there. Undoubtedly, it screwed things up a little bit. And some, then you sort of notice it. You say, oh, yeah, that's right. We should not have increased that bow by the, the 5%. It should have actually only been 3%. I mean, I'm making us up a story here. So you learn and you sort of had this feedback. And sort of that's how, in a certain sense, natural selection or evolution works. There's this sort of self-correct and so on. So that's fine. And, and evolution is prime, is a large part of evolution is incremental. <clears throat> but if you want to do what Brunel did, an increase by a factor of two, effectively, and you don't understand how you're supposed to scale up every single piece of this rather complicated and in many ways complex machinery, you are destined, I would say, to screw up. It would be a miracle if you got it right, if you make a huge change. So I think that's, that's one of the lessons that comes out of it, is that incrementalism can work and you can self-correct if you have the time and energy and money. But major changes and indeed major innovations often, you know, they may innovate, but you also have to be prepared for these kinds of phenomena that Brunel ran into. You made a really important point as well that you you alluded to it. Brunel's ambition to, uh, you know, divide, conquer <laughs> The, and bring the English, you know, everywhere, the United Kingdom everywhere was driving. So it was it was financial reward. Equally, that's what happened here. There was a pressure on him to overperform. So he tried to jump evolution without the science. And that's what happens in organizations when the board come down, you know, a CEO comes down and goes, we need to be more innovative, we need to innovate. And the organization hasn't been trained on how to do that. And then things break down. One, you're, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, so on the one hand, you know, one of the problems with most organizations is that they don't innovate, that you, we clearly need, uh, you know, you need to be continually innovating, but you need to be prepared for innovation. You need to have people um, both educated and have the culture that can take advantage of uh, major innovations. So I think that's, um, you know, that's a crucial lesson to learn. It's not, you know, you can't... You, you need to have all of the above, so to speak. So, um, and in fact, that's what, so one of the great things that uh, Frau did, of course, was to recognize that, look, um, what we should be doing, is first of all, understanding the fundamental science of, of uh, you know, ships moving or objects moving through water, you know, that's, a, um, and, um, and so, uh, you know, and, and, and he had this idea that uh, this idea, he realized that it had been a scaling problem. And then he took <clears throat> what was an enormous leap, an extraordinary insight, which seems sort of obvious now. Well, <clears throat> what we should do is build a scale model of the ship this big, <laughs> size of my desk, and put it in a you know, a big water tub, and watch what happens. Well, that's the sort of, that's sort of the, I don't know, the core of the idea, and then scale up. But that's the problem. How do you scale up? What is it? It's not, again, linear. So it's the equation, so to speak, the, the, the underlying science that then tells you, if you watch what happens, you know, on, on the size of this room for a ship, moving. Um, it tells you how to scale up what you see there and measure to 
something that's hundreds of feet long uh, in the in the ocean. And by the way, you can also simulate waves, of course. It's not just moving through water. You can simulate waves and so on. So he invented the whole idea of having these tanks and so on. And by the way, he was much poo-pooed when he did this. And in fact, the, the, the sort of the leading naval engineering architect at the time, whose name I'm afraid I have forgotten, um, uh, who was um, head of the Society of Naval Architects. John Russell. Russell, John Russell, exactly. Who had actually been, I think, a, um, a partner earlier on with um, Brunel, thought this was a stupid idea. You know, this is sort of like kids playing, you know, in a pool kind of thing, and didn't really appreciate the science. And of course, when it proved, it, it's one of those cases, when it proved to be powerful and correct, and of course, by the way, that's how everything now is done, basically, um, in some form or another. He, of course, said, oh, yes, of course, of course, I had that idea. I was the person that, you know, et cetera, one of those people. I know you're you're very humble and you, but I, you write brilliantly. And there's a couple of quotes here that just bring it all together beautifully. And it's so, it, it, this sounds great when you're telling the stories and then I can share these quotes. It's not to get my voice in there, just to say. No, <laughs> um, it's wonderful. You're, go ahead, please. Because so I forgot you, what I wrote. Of course. Well, it's, it's, it's been a while. So you said studying turbulence gave us the first important mathematical insights into the concept of complexity and its relationship to nonlinearity. Complex systems often manifest chaotic behavior in which a small change or perturbation in one part of the system produces an exponentially enhanced response in some other part. As we discussed earlier in traditional linear thinking, a small perturbation produces a commensurately small response. The highly non-intuitive enhancement in non-linear systems is properly expressed, as we talked before, as the butterfly effect, in which the mythical flapping of a butterfly's wings in Brazil produces a hurricane in Florida. Despite years of intense theoretical and experimental study, a general understanding of turbulence remains an unsolved problem in physics, even when we have learned an enormous amount about it. Indeed, the famous physicist Richard Feynman describe turbulence as the most important unsolved problem of classical physics. And you tell us, William Froud may not have fully recognized just how big a challenge he was facing. But he did perceive that for applications to shipbuilding, a new strategy was needed. It was in this context that he invented the new methodology of modeling and by extension, the concept of scaling theory for determining how quantitative results from small scale investigations could be used to help predict how full size ships would behave. In the spirit of Galileo, Froude realized that almost all scaling is nonlinear. So traditional models based on the fateful one by one representation were not useful for determining how figuring out to scale from small sizes would scale up to full size objects. And I just wanted to share that because that brings everything together and hopefully makes sense to our audience that that that's all the stuff we've talked about before. And even the science of complexity that you and the brilliant Santa Fe Institute bring to life are so important to understand both innovation, how things evolve, but also ultimately the future of the planet that we're going to talk about in the next episode. Uh, I, I think a large part of the problem um, is uh, th there's, there's several aspects in terms of <clears throat> being perceived by, uh, say, non-scientists is that, first of all, you know, in our sort of normal day-to-day -day world, uh, we tend to think linearly, um, you know, and we tend to think incrementally. And, uh, you know, uh, what happened yesterday is sort of like today. You know, they used to say, by the way, you know, you, in the old days, before we had all these marvelous ways of predicting weather, you know, you could do just as well by saying, tomorrow, today's weather is going to be like, yesterday's and you would do just as well <laughs> you know it was that kind of thinking that permeated um you know it permeates much of our sort of normal daily life that's one thing so non-linearity is very hard to perceive somehow even though 
it's sort of obvious in our, you know, in our personal relations, after all, <laughs> we certainly see it, you know, the way we interact with each other and so forth is highly nonlinear, um, you know, uh, and indeed even analogs to chaotic phenomenon, you know, some small effect can destroy a marriage. I mean, I don't want to be, <laughs> but, you know, it can have very profound effects, but something that seems small seems bigger, yet, yet we don't sort of think in those terms somehow. Our brain likes to think in incremental short periods or, or short distances and, not, and, and in a linear fashion. But much of the world and the world we've been talking about is highly nonlinear, as you um, reminded us from that quote. Um, and the other thing that we're very bad at is understanding exponential, even though it's used colloquially. Um, and that many of these things have um, have exponential consequences. And that sometimes that can be thought of as good, because if I invest, you know, in, in a dollar today, and it grows exponentially, I'm a very rich man rather quickly. And in fact, all the rich investors in the world have benefited from that trivial sort of mathematical observation. Um, but, um, it, but in other things, it can be quite disastrous. Uh, because you, you know, as you, you quickly run into something that's unsustainable. Um, and that's part of the issue that we're facing in terms of the future of the planet. We have been expanding exponentially um, and, uh, you know, willy nilly. In fact, it's built in to our whole socioeconomic paradigm um, that, that began with the Industrial Revolution. Um, but, and, and the discovery of um, entrepreneurism and uh, capitalism and free markets, which have been so enormously successful and fantastic, but they have and, and they've led to this this sort of integration into it of open-ended exponential growth without consequences, and that's the that's and that's the piece that has been missing is to not recognize that at some stage you may run into big problems. And in fact, I believe quite strongly we are running into big problems. And many of the problems we're facing today are begin are the, the, the leading edge of the, these, these consequences of, of this dynamic that has propelled us to this extraordinary standard and quality of life. The picture I see in my head is unfortunately an unfortunate game of musical chairs where the chairs are running out, you know, and equally, we see that with the the size of the planet, or the the population of the planet, and it's not it's not so much just enough food and water to sub provide for those people. It's pensions because if people are living for longer and still retiring, <laughs> you're like, how will I provide going forward and stuff like that? Is these are all questions that I I certainly don't have faith in governments that they're thinking about that because they're, as, as we talked about, they're being measured on short term and thinking about the next voting round rather than thinking actually long term. Yes, that's, uh, I think in the end, I, I've concluded that um, in some ways, uh, the, the, maybe the major challenge, or certainly one of the truly major challenges is the um, tension between the, the time scales of political action, or or how should I say, it, uh, of the political process, uh, versus the timescales of the trying to solve these problems, because to deal with these problems um, requires, you know, thinking in terms of five, 10, 20, 50 years, maybe 100 years, and uh, the political processes, um, you know, I, I use the phrase, you know, two years is infinity. You know, it's you have to think about the next election. Um, you know, what, whatever. You know, and you want to and you want to solve immediate problems very quickly in order to get elected re or re-elected. So, um, and, and those two things are in you know are in tension between them. And added to that, we don't have much time. You know, it's not it's we can't just sort of wait around and hope that we can solve that kind of social problem, if you like that, you know, we change the political system, that ain't going to happen. And if it does, if it were to happen, it might take 100 years. Uh, by then, 
um, you know, t- terrible things might have happened. The problem that is outside of science, by the way. So, so that's one of my own personal frustrations is that, you know, some of us working and thinking about this can provide conceptual frameworks and the thinking and the background science and even do the detailed analyses, which many people do of these various phenomena <clears throat> that contribute to sustainability and climate change and sustainability of markets and so on, all these various big questions. And, and even the one that you just raised, which is crucial, just making sure that as people live longer, you know, we can support them. Um, you know, the, the, all these various things, which are long-term issues, um, we can supply, you know, I think we can come to terms with all that. But in the end, the the the, the solution is going to be political action by politicians who are in power. And, um, you know, we don't see much evidence of that. And again, partly that's because the political systems um, we have evolved um, um, to, as I say, two years is infinity. It's a horrible kind of thought, but, you know, in some ways, a benevolent dictator who will be there for the next 25 years, a benevolent dictator, um, which is an oxymoron, presumably, uh, and mostly anyway, um, is, is maybe the right way to do it. You know, someone, you know, which I hate. I mean, that just goes against our, you know, it's, uh, you know, I don't, I don't say that is the solution, but it just brings up that issue is can put it slightly differently and less provocatively, you know, to what extent can democracy, however it is, it is expressed, um, solve this problem? You know, the way democracy has evolved in most places across the planet. Um, and it's, and, and by the way, just a total speculation it could well be that we're seeing the rise of authoritarianism in some curious way because there is some kind of collective intuition that democracy can't solve these problems and we need some strong leader like you know Donald Trump or, well, the Russians have always had some version of that, like Putin, but, uh, you know, we see it in India, Muti, and, uh, you know, all back in Hungary, you know, but people searching for, you know, it, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a couch, what is it, um, you know, a couch psychologist uh, that looking for father to solve the problem, you know, dad knows everything, surely he can solve this. So let's find a big, big daddy that could do it. I mean, I'm being again, sarcastic and uh, cartoonish, but you know, I wonder about that. That's total speculation, but but it is that, you know, uh, in the end, it is it, it's political action. We can do all the science. Um, we inform. We do our best. There needs to be more of it. There isn't. Uh, we still need much more. But nevertheless, we could solve it. I think we could come to terms with this. But unless there's action and recognition, I mean, we can hardly get recognition of climate change. I mean, we have across many parts of the world, people have come to terms with it to some extent, or at least to dealing with it. In this country, United States, <clears throat> it's a continuous battle. And it's, you know, we do some, but it's diddly on the scale of what needs to be done. So yeah. and that's just one problem, by the way. I mean, climate change, despite the the, the fact that it plays center stage in many of these discussions, um, is really just one of many problems. And in fact, I'm slightly concerned that it plays too much center stage. It's not, I mean, in the sense that we tend to then forget about all these other issues. And, and if you believe, you know, if you understand to some extent complex adaptive systems, you realize they're all interconnected. So you better attack them all. It's so important. And, and for our audience who are interested in that, that's going to be the focus of, of part four. And Jeffrey's kindly agreed to come back for part four. And we'll talk about the planet and and scaling and how it affects the planet. One of the things that just jumped to mind there was how, you know, we, we talked about aging, we talked about the amazing advances that humankind has made on aging, and that for every year that passes by, we're adding on a year in the longevity of, of humankind or more, perhaps. But 
you're going to go for what though? Because <laughs> we're ruining the planet, and that's that's kind of the way you got to think about everything in in unison. That that they're all interconnected as well. And the other thing I thought about, I don't, I think, I think we mentioned it before, but there's a, a, a brilliant show on Netflix called Don't Look Up about the comet coming for Earth. Oh, oh yes, is that, there was a, that with um, DiCaprio, yes, yeah, and Jennifer Lawrence, yeah, 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 and that's, yes, yes, that yeah. was. Uh, did you see it? Uh, yes, I did see yeah. it. Uh, well, that reminds me of you know. DiCaprio plays, you know, we're not ruining for here, no spoiler, but there's a comet heading for Earth. DiCaprio discovers it and tells everyone and then he becomes like this media star and they make it into this whole, a whole kind of media tour. And then they try and mine the comet rather than destroy it. And it's too late. And it's it's literally about climate changes. Exactly. It was a brilliant sort of uh, metaphor for exactly the kind of thing I sort of stumbled through trying to describe of this relationship between sort of science and what science tries to do and to inform policy, create new knowledge, create new ways of thinking, and to attack some of these big questions. And the way when it's, when it's supplied to the politicians and the policy makers and, the, and some of the practitioners, it gets perverted and perverted both in the, that's what was so brilliant about that, perverted a, boy, maybe we can exploit this. You know, first of all, you know, that's one of the first things is the idea of exploitation. And then, you know, and then sort of subverting the whole idea that the planet is going to come to an end um, into a, just a show. You know, it's not even, you know, we don't really take this seriously, you know. And that's sort of what's happened. And I, so I thought it was very brilliant, actually, that... Yeah take it out of the context of, you know, some of these big questions, in, uh, and especially climate change, and, um, uh, and put it into something that's, um, that, that isn't going to happen, actually, namely, you know, a, 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 an asteroid, I mean, it's exceedingly unlikely, I think, an asteroid is going to come, that's coming, and it's going to be here in a few months and destroy the planet. That's, you know, that's, that's not, that's exceedingly unlikely, I would say. But to use that, I thought, was very clever as a threat to the planet. Because even though an asteroid is not out there on its way to the planet, metaphorically, it is. I mean, metaphorically, we are. There is a great big bloody asteroid heading, and it's going to be here in, you know, uh, 10, 20, 30 years. And it's going to potentially... It's going to, well, I'll use the word destroy in quotes. It's going to have profound effects. And uh, we don't that, even know. We, we, we don't have know. no idea. I don't know if, you know, yeah. I mean, I've speculated that it goes everywhere from, you know, just, uh, you know, returning us to hunter gatherers, <laughs> to, uh, which, but I think more than that, you know, I mean, just to jump ahead and we'll talk about this next time. And it's total speculation because next time I want to about the science part of this, you know, and the uh, the conceptual framework for it. But but um, you know what will happen, of course, before this happens, uh, the, you know, Armageddon strike, so to speak. We'll just get more and more social unrest and uh, more and more sort of craziness and more disease, all kinds of things like that. The the sort of dark side of of uh, what we've created and. Uh, what that will lead to, I don't know. It may, it may be that in the end, the destruction comes. And, and it's sort of interesting watching Ukraine that we're, you know, in the background there, there's this talk about, will Putin use a nuclear weapon? You know, I mean, it's sort of unbelievable to think that, I mean, on the scale of the problems of the planet, that Putin would want to get you know what it's like? I hate to say this to it. I'll probably get killed for this. It's sort of like the British or the English, not the British, the English saying, you know, Ireland's always been part of England. We've always been it. Okay, we're coming back. We're taking over. You know, you buggers, why are you, you know, you know you're part of England. You've always been since, you know, Edward the whatever, <laughs> Edward the second or whatever it was. We'd love to have Boris as our leader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I mean, it's sort of like that, that we'd send troops over. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, it's like we've gone totally mad. And and the, 
so a that's mad of itself uh, but it's mad in terms of the problems we're facing on the planet the priorities <laughs> talk about you know i mean it's like where are you know it's just incredible that we have to turn our attention to this and that it's blown up i mean I know it's an unfortunate choice of words but it's it's expanded into even you know sort of there in the background um and these discussions will he use nuclear weapons and uh, you know and it's a fa- it's a fascinating question of course I and mean, horrible yeah. but it shouldn't be there none of this you know we have these no. other you know we have so the real problems <laughs> real yeah. problems other than yeah. ego other than ego and the ego yes it would be like boris johnson i say just going back to that like he did you know or the the, the right wing in england that uh, you know deciding that the the, the the irish are actually part of the uh, of england of the of the united kingdom if you're okay with this i thought I'd bring it back to Fred. And then we'd finish on that because the the train of thought we're on there, and then we'll come to the planet the next day. And what I'm thinking here is that, just like you said, two years is infinity. And if everybody takes that as a mental model, like the politician trying to get elected again, and dealing with short term problems, because that's what they're most measured on. That's what happens in organizations as well. A leader gets elected, essentially gets brought in new board, we want you to change the place. And it's like, how can I make incremental changes that are most visible first, rather than transformational big jump evolutionary jumps, and I won't get measured on. And the reason I bring that up is those type of leaders as JFK wrote in his profiles of courage book are not very successful. It's like almost it never really ends well for a whistleblower, people who do the right thing don't always get celebrated that way. And this is why I loved Froud, because you said here, and I love this. And it will speak to our audience so much, Jeffrey, there's a paragraph I'd love to comment, I'd love you to comment on. And I know it will absolutely please our audience because you say of Froud here who's battling the status quo, like many new ideas that threatened to change the way we think about an old problem, Froud's endeavors were at first dismissed as irrelevant by the cognoscenti of the time. John Russell, who we mentioned, who founded the Institution for Naval Architects in London, in England in 1860, in order to encourage the formal education of ship, ship designers, ridiculed Froud, saying, you will have on the small scale a series of beautiful and interesting little experiments, which I am sure will afford <laughs> terrible accent will afford Mr. Froud infinite pleasure in the making of them and will afford you infinite pleasure in the hearing of them, but which are quite remote from any practical results upon the large scale. And many of us, as you say, recognize this kind of rhetoric often aimed at scholarly or academic research with the implication that it is out of touch with the real world. Well, no doubt much of it is, but much of it isn't. And more to the point, it is very often difficult to perceive in the moment, the potential impact of some piece of seemingly arcane research, much of our entire technologically driven society and extraordinarily quality, extraordinary quality of life that many of us are privileged to enjoy is the result of such research. There is a continuing tension in society between supporting what is perceived as pie in the sky basic research, with no obvious immediate benefit versus highly directed research focused on useful real world problems. <laughs> but I love that quote. And I picked that specifically because I thought I thought that speaks to and you couldn't have done a better job of teeing that up. But it, it actually brings it all together beautifully. Well, thank you for quoting. I'd forgotten that. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say. I, well, I, of course, I think that way all the time. But I'd forgotten I'd written it. So it was quite good. Actually, I have to admit. Bravo, <laughs> bravo so, sir. Bravo. So I'll, I'll take that. Um, but it is true. No, I mean, just to bring it back to what we were discussing, it is absolutely true, how difficult it is to uh, get new ideas accepted. And um, uh, Froud's case is a fantastic example, especially that case, because it 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 completely changed 
um, the way you know we think about things, we do engineering and so on. I mean, um, model making models is sort of just taken for granted. And and there's also you know the other thing that's interesting about this is that you just assume people have always done that. You don't realize it only goes back well now 150 years at most. You know, people didn't think that way. This was a whole new way, a whole new paradigm for thinking about design and innovation and um, and moving ahead. And it involves the idea of, of scale. And scale, so scale and model, uh, you know, they're not quite synonymous, but they're, they're, they're quite intertwined. And, and it goes back to Mr. Froud. And it goes back to also what we were talking about earlier, you need the science and you need yes. the experience, you need both of those wor working in parallel speaking to each other. Hence why we talked about the last day, we need to solve complex problems, we need complex teams, we need people outside their swim lanes swimming together in the same direction working towards the same goal. And, and by the way, I have to you know, I mean, we're always complaining that we don't get enough funding. And I think that's certainly true. But you know, you have to, I, I, I always say, you know, you have to look on the other side, it is fantastic that governments do support basic research. I mean, they do, there is a recognition somewhere that some is, but, you know, I have to tell you, one of the great changes that has taken place during my career, and especially in the last 20 years, is that propensity, which is expressed in that paragraph, the governments say, well, yeah, you know, okay, we, could, we should be supporting some, you know, pie in the sky, basic research and so on. But really, what we really want to support is how does it affect this problem and tell us about, you know, solving this problem and so on. And they invent all kinds of fancy terms to do that that you're supposed to write about in your proposal. The idea, which was sort of rampant post-war, maybe probably pre-war, but in a way was a um, child of the Manhattan Project ironically, was, was, of course, first of all, the recognition that science can have profound implications for so-called practical problems, in that case, a horrible one, creating an atomic bomb, um, but came from the most arcane science, fundamental physics, atomic and nuclear physics. Um, but that, so that led to the idea that was sort of in the background of the support by federal agencies of science, find the smartest people, give them the money and let them get on with it, which, you know, sounds highly entitled. But in fact, that has been an amazing formula. And we and society can't sustain that. There's always that feeling, ah, you know, these guys are doing stuff that's so sort of irrelevant and who cares? So who cared about atoms? And who cared about, uh, you know, nuclei and so on? And uh, who cares about, I mean, one of the best examples, I'll tell you one anecdote. So when I was a graduate student, um, a man, um, I, I worked, I, I knew I wanted to become a theoretical physicist, but um, I recognized also, I felt very strongly that physics is an ex fundamentally an experimental science and you really has to be driven by experiment observation and the interplay between theory and modeling and uh, experiment. So I worked at the beginning with a marvelous man named Arthur Shallow, who eventually got the Nobel Prize for jointly discovering with his brother-in-law, actually Charlie Towns, the laser. And I worked with him on one of the earliest lasers and uh, this is at Stanford. And um, we were doing a sort of atomic physics with it and so on. And there was this fantastic beam, you know, and I would I one evening, we, he was often in the lab there. And I'd said to him, you know, Art, um, what uh, we were discussing this whole question, the practicality of science, and he'd come from Bell Labs, by the way, so he was very familiar with this, and we were discussing it. And I was arguing for you know, free and easy and so on. So I said, well, actually, like, here, we're doing this stuff, this basic research. What use is this? You know, this laser. 
And he said, oh, this is going to have a huge effect. This is going to be really profound. <laughs> I said, really? Like what? He said, well, you know, we always, so when we had visitors to the lab, we would take a little block of wood about this big, you know, maybe two inches square, and we put it on a little tripod, and then we'd shoot the laser beam, and it would drill a little hole through it, you know, and we'd always show that people, you know, it was great to see in those days. And he would say, well, you know, this little demonstration we do, that's going to revolutionize the planet, because we will be able to cut steel to any accuracy, basically. And that's going to revolutionize the planet. Well, he got it completely wrong. It didn't, that's not where it revolutionized the planet with his bloody laser. The laser revolutionized the planet in doing what we're doing now. It was part of the input to the IT revolution and all the digital stuff is the laser. It did revolutionize the planet, but not in the way even Art Shallow, the inventor, could conceive. So it's a fantastic story, I think, um, of, you know, not just even the scientists, even when you do the science, you don't know where it's going to lead. And society does need to, to varying degrees, support people doing this kind of work. And it will have an impact. Everything in the end, to varying degrees, will have an impact, hopefully for good, sometimes for bad. Beautiful way to finish. Let's finish it on that, man. That's a, a nice upbeat way to think about it. And I really, really am so appreciative of your time. I know our audience are getting so much great uh, feedback. I'm getting unbelievable feedback about these episodes, oh, good, Jeffrey. Good. So I'm glad I'm to pass it. I'm with you, Aiden. First of yeah. all, I have to say this. This sounds hokey in your head. I, I do like to, I, 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 I'm one of those admirers of Irish accents and the Irish. <laughs> I hate to say that. It's even I don't. A, I don't even think I have one. That's patronizing. I know. Not at all. Well, I actually don't even think I have one, which is uh, funny. <laughs> you should hear my, my father's accent. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. Well, yeah. Anyway, no, I enjoy that very much. I, uh... Pleasure, man. An absolute pleasure. And uh, I'll do a sign off now. And don't forget, yeah. people, I, I just keep saying to everybody I meet, you got to buy a copy of this book. It's so <laughs> valuable. It creates so many aha moments and um, as uh, like just analogies and metaphors that you can kind of go, oh, well, that's just like this. And you have those kind of beautiful moments throughout the book, which... Um, I just wanted to pass on to you as well, because it's so, so useful to hear, to hear that, I think, as well. It's, it's refreshing to hear those things, I think. I, 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 you should have been my publicity agent. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it's, it's a brilliant book. I love it. And I'm so looking forward to a really important issue, which is part four, Auto yeah, of that's... Scale, The Universal Laws of Life and Death in Organisms, Cities and Companies. Jeffrey West, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Aiden. Lovely. We'll look forward to next time. I want to thank our sponsor, Zai. Zai is boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded finance products and services, empowering businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and to move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. And I'll see you next week.